let's see if I can get you a little bit of help. They got some kind of funny hits off you. Give me the great big guy. Here. I would have hit the ball. Nobody up. Watch the line drive. Don't let the second baseman tag it, and what? Hey, come on! Come on, Jenny! Hey, come on! Hey, Sam, 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 watch the second base! Hi, boy, Dan. Nice ball, nice side. 1970 was a great year for our twins. They won their second straight Western Division title. Through it all, we at Midwest Federal led the rooting as the number one sports fan. We had faith in Calvin Griffith and his fine manager, Bill Rigney, not to mention the other coaches and players who made a great contribution to much of the effort that won the season. 1970 was the first year of our association as the twins broadcast rights holder. We feel it will be a long and great relationship for both of us. We at Midwest Federal believe that sports are a vital force in influencing the youth of our country in the right direction. We will continue to do all we can in 1971 and the ensuing seasons to further this cause and help make this a great country. For Bill Rigney, it was a new and challenging job in a former home. A major league manager of 14 seasons, Rigney began his managing career with Minneapolis of the old American Association. Portrait of a winner is the story of the 1970 Minnesota Twins as described by its new field leader. As a manager, I don't think I ever entered a season as keyed as I did in 1970 as manager of the Minnesota Twins. One of the main reasons I was so keyed in 1970 is perhaps because of what went on in 1969, and I thought it was the best team that I'd ever managed, and I knew that there was a lot at stake and for a lot of people, and including Bill Rigney, and I think this got me keyed, and I never quite got it done until it was all over. One of the biggest thrills that I had in 1970 was opening day here at the Met as manager of the Twins. It was more or less like a homecoming. Well, you know, uh, like every opening day, I think everyone has a certain, there's a certain amount of excitement to it. And, and uh, I know coming back here to the Twin Cities as uh, the manager of this great ball club that did so well last year, I know that uh, uh, the adrenaline's pumping in the manager right now, and, and uh, I'm not only looking forward to this day, but uh, to a great many days here in the Twin Cities. We had a terrible spring uh, as far as winning and losing, and uh, I knew and we all knew that coming off the season they had in 1969 that it was going to be very important for us to get off good. And this club of ours just found a way to get out of the starting gate as good as any club I've ever managed. Opening day at Metropolitan Stadium. Cross Coast rival Oakland was given an early season nod to dethrone Minnesota. Throwing out the opening day ball, all-time Senators great and Twins controller Ossie Bloogie. Jim Cott pitched a complete game this day, a leisure the Twins pitching staff seldom enjoyed. Cott struck out seven and gave up seven hits en route to an eight to two win. The Twins had jumped from the starting gate. By late May, we went into first place. And this club of ours had found a way to win two out of every three or three out of every four and never had a bad losing streak and was able to win most of the series that we played. For a stretch of about 10 or 12 games, Rod Carew, to me, was a complete one-man gang. Getting off to a good start was one of our main objectives, and Brand Alley certainly filled that bill. During his early season rampage in April, Allier drove in 23 runs, hit five home runs, and was hitting 415 in his first 17 games as a twin. It was a baptism in glory. Then some of the bad breaks hit us, and I don't think I've ever seen so many injuries to such key players as we had in 1970. And the injury to Rod Carew was probably the worst. This was not a year to mend for Rod Carew. On June 22nd, Carew would have ligaments torn in his right knee in a play at second base. 
the Twins had lost the league's best hitter for virtually the entire season. Rod Carew could be baseball's finest hitter for the simple reason that there's no easy way or any set way to defend against him. As many times as we tried him, Dave Boswell just couldn't regain that 1969 form. Our next blow was the Tion injury. After winning six in a row, he finally came down with a bad arm. Tion's main strength is that it's in his delivery. He just baffles the hitter. The injury to Stan Williams was a real blow. He and Peronowski were so important to us that we couldn't do without Stan Williams. This was the pitch, a forced curveball which sidelined Stan Williams for 10 days. Diagnosis, torn muscles in his right side. With all these injuries, our thinking had to change, and we had to go with the youngsters. We had to move Bill Zepp from the bullpen to a starting role, and this young man jumped right into the middle of a championship season and just did a great job for us. We had to go to our minor league system and bring up Bert Bly Levin. The 19-year-old became just a phenom overnight, and I think he grew up overnight. Not exactly classed as a rookie, but Tommy Hall in his second year had to become a starter for us, a regular starter, and picked up the ball when we needed it the most. This young infielder, Danny Thompson, had to fill a big gap in filling Rod Carew's shoes, and for a young man, 23 years old, he certainly got the job done. Danny Thompson is a shortstop by trade, and having to come to the major leagues in the middle of a championship season and learn to play second base was no easy task, and this young man did it and got it done, and uh, he just helped us tremendously during the season. Thompson started very well for us as a hitter. I think perhaps with the pressures of the championship season, the, the race itself, and the pressures that we put upon this young man perhaps had to pay a toll, and they did, I think, in his batting average, but I think he's gonna hit in the major leagues. I don't think anyone really knows when or when not to take a pitcher out, and I guess I've had a reputation of being called Captain Hook, but I've always felt that perhaps it's a better a little bit too soon than a little bit too late. The most important change that a manager has to make is when the game, when you're managing in a one to nothing or a one run game, and the, now you're in the eighth or ninth inning and the game's in jeopardy. With the wind, you know his ball doesn't think as good with the wind. Today. Not today, no. no. You got men on first and third, first all right? Third two yeah, right? Come on, one to get right here. Come on, get us out of here. Now we got a long no, way to go. Come on, let's go. Sometimes people wonder why a manager did what he did at a certain time, and I think the hitter of the opposition has a lot to do with that. Well, you just got that one pitch a little too good on that guy, 2 and 0, didn't you? Yeah. Tried to come up in, under his neck? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the biggest reason we change is when you're starting pitcher, you can obviously see him tiring. Come on, maybe you can throw a ground ball down to Lear or somebody can get out of here with one run. Come on, you got a good lead now. All right. People wonder why we bring a man in so quickly and uh, if he's ready or not. But uh, we never bring anyone in unless we had the sign from the bullpen that our man is ready. Kind of a funny day, all right? You got a man on first base and one man out. get us out of here. Come on, Ronnie. Ron Paranowski and Stan Williams. These two great relievers of ours were involved in 66 wins that we had in 1970, and uh, I don't think any two men deserve any more credit than these two. Two things make Ron Paranowski effective. The first one is his motion, which people sometimes fail to realize, and the second is that he has great control and he throws a sinker ball, so he keeps the ball in the infield and in play most of the time. Stan Williams' effectiveness comes from his great control and I think his great size. He kind of awes some of the hitters and he comes in there and, and he's ahead of everyone. He's never behind too many, so I think this is his strength. The starters on our pitching staff, of course, were led by Jim Perry. And I think Jim's effectiveness lies in the fact that he can grind you. He, he's always ahead. He is, a, he is a good sinker and a good sliding ball, but he's always strike one and strike two, and this is what makes him so effective. Jim Cott perhaps is not as fast as he was, say, four or five years ago, but Jim Cott now knows how to pitch. 
not not only pitches well, but has, has other assets. And one of them is the fact that he can pinch run, and because he's a good base runner and has good speed and good knowledge of base running. Blessed on this club with having some pretty good hitting pitchers, and Cott is one of them. And this keeps him in the ball game a little bit longer. The fact that he could get a base hit for us. You know, in the meantime, we were getting great seasons from our veteran players who had, in 1969, their greatest seasons. Having uh, Harmon Killebrew's name in the lineup seems to do something to our club. But so the fact that he's there and that he is going to hit. And I think this is one of the reasons why I find such a tough job not putting his name in the lineup. Kilroy doesn't get many headlines about his fielding, but watching him over a championship season, you can appreciate the fact that he has a great pair of hands and the fact that he can play first base. Tony Oliva has to be one of baseball's finest hitters. I guess the most simple explanation for why he is is that he doesn't want to base on balls. He's up there to hit the ball, and he hits the ball hard to all fields, so it's tough to defend against this kind of a hitter. Tony Oliva has one of baseball's most accurate throwing arms to me, and his ability to charge the ball just makes this a twice as deadly a weapon. Cardenas has got probably one of baseball's greatest pair of hands. And oftentimes, as a manager sitting on the bench, and when we need a crucial out, I'll just say out loud to myself, now I'll just hit it right down to Leo. One of the things uh, that makes Leo Cardenas especially important to any club is the fact that as a shortstop, he can not only hit for an average, but hits the ball out of the ballpark and will hit from 10 to 15 home runs for you. Into the stretch goes Murphy. His pitch is hit solidly to center. Back pedaling Gonzalez turns, goes back near the running path, and he cannot get it and falls down as the ball hits the fence at the 430 mark. Tovar being waved on in as Cardenas heads for third. The throw will not be in time. It's a triple for Leo. What a club. Cesar Tovar. This is our trigger man. He gets us started. For a little man, he carries a big stick, and uh, oftentimes he can hit the ball right out of the ballpark in any ballpark. Tovar is probably our finest base runner and our fastest, and I've given him a free reign to steal at any time, and for this reason, that he knows when to steal and when not to steal, and this is all important, and to get him to steal a base at the right time, which he often does, has been one of his biggest assets. The basic philosophy of base running is not only hustle, but knowing when to take the extra base. The extra base can win as many games as a pitcher getting the last out. Another hue in the portrait of a winner, the coaches. At first base, Vern Morgan. At third, Frank Crossetti. 
How do these first and third base exhorters control the action at their stations? For the first time, the Twins coaches were wired for the answer. Watch the line drive. Don't let the second baseman tag you on the ground ball. Now, one up. Hey! Come on, Al. Hey, one time. Be ready for anything. Come on. Watch the throw from the catcher. I got him. Hey, pick up the ball. Come on. Get him up, get him below. Hey! Take a look at the outfield. Here's you get your sign. All right, nobody near you. All right. Come on, get up, Jim. Hurry up, boy. Get up at the pitch now. Get a good jump. I would have hit the ball, Cotton. You got to get a good jump now. I would have hit that ball, young fella. All right, come on. Come on, get up, Jim. Get up, come on. I right, you got to get a better jump than that. I right, you can't get him up. Hey, come on. Hey, run it up, Charlie! Come on over here! All right, all right. Come on, get up! Come on, come on! Hey, there, 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 there! One out. Watch the line drive, man. Don't let the second baseman tag you with a ground ball. One away. Take a look at the outfielder. One out. How about James? Two away Thank now. Tony, I'll leave out. Watch, uh, watch a wild pitcher. You never know. Right here. Right here. If I call your first name, Danny, Elwood will be the squeeze. Hey, George, come on. Make it come, make it come. No, 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 no. Come back here. Ah, boy, I would have hit that ball. <laughs> Two out now. During the season, uh, we were also getting good seasons from some of our other performers. Rich Reese is one of the most intense players I've ever managed, and I've never seen a player that hustled as hard and played as hard as this young man. I think Reese's strength with the bat is the fact that he has to hit behind a player like either Harmon Killebrew or Tony Oliva, due to the fact that Reese is a good hitter with men on base. And I think this is one of the big things that makes our lineup so strong with a man like Reese in it. We put quite a burden on George Middlewald when we made him the first string catcher. And, however, I think that he carried it well and, and uh, did a fine job for us. George Middlewald, and I'm sure the records will prove this out, uh, has one of the finest throwing arms in baseball. And we didn't lose too many games because of a stolen base. Paul Ratliff has as much strength on this ball club as any man, with the exception of Harmon Killington. Curtis is a manager's player. He's always in the ball game, and the, the one big thing that he always adds when he's playing is that he's got a great desire and a great deal of hustle. Jim Holt got as many hits with a man on third base and two outs as any player we had, and that's a tough hit to get. Holt may not be the fastest base runner in our club or the fastest man in our club, but Jim Holt has a great instinct about running the bases and has been able to take the extra base for us when it meant something. Rick Rennick is one of the unsung men on, the, on any ball club. Uh, he doesn't get the headlines, but when you give him a job to do, he gets it done. In 1970, we used quite a few outfielders. And as much as we wanted to make the outs, we couldn't quite make all of them. fond of umpires, uh, I can't wait uh, to get out to see them. During the race and when the race got hot, our ability to beat the California club and the Oakland club, I think, made the difference in the 1970 season. I think in playing against the California club, 
a club that was a contender along with us all year long. I think our club played as well as they played against any club, and perhaps they might have felt that it was going to be a matter of a personal satisfaction with the new manager, but whatever the reason was, I thought they performed great against the Californians. In playing against the Oakland club, we knew that this was the club that we had to beat if we were to win. And I think the biggest thing that we did against this club that our pitchers contained some of their fine hitters. And we were able to not perhaps score as much as we would like, but it was always going to be enough. Oriole pitcher Mike Cuellar slammed the door on the Twins World Series hopes. The Twins would have to content themselves with a Western Division American League Championship. <laughs> Once again, as in 1969, we didn't play too well in the playoffs and didn't fare well. However, I guess it gives us something to think about for 1971 and hope that we can face those Baltimores one more time. 1970 was the year when 12-year Senators and Twins veteran Bob Allison announced his retirement and was given his night at the Met. It was also the year when Harmon Killebrew journeyed closer to baseball's Hall of Fame. The mightiest of the Twins responded with 41 home runs and 113 RBIs. After that first season, I think I finally come back to earth after being about a foot off the ground all season. Hey, get out of here! Get up out of here! Get up out of here! Who's got it? Tony. 